Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. This is the Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Today, I'm thrilled that we have a, a guest. We kind of share a name. Uh, he's brand new senator, Carl Rhodes. Uh, just recently moved from the House to the Senate, won his election. Congratulations to him, and welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. No, I, I, I think it's excellent. I was really thrilled. All of us were sad when Susie decided she wanted to retire. Because I don't know anybody who doesn't like Susie. And she, her work ethic was what has always inspired me. Absolutely, as well. yeah. She, work, she works, worked very, very, very hard. She still does. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so when I saw the opening and uh, when I learned that you were going to run for it, I was very thrilled because I'd also been following a bit of what you had been doing from the House, and, and I always had great respect for you as well, so I was thrilled about that opportunity. Thanks. Appreciate it. So no, so, uh, so congratu congratulations once again. So Thanks so much. Looking forward to see everything that you're going to do now from the Senate seat. Uh, which is kind of what this episode is going to be about. So we're going to talk about, now that you're a senator, I, I'm going to ask you real quickly to go over something we were talking about a second ago, um, and that is, what's the difference? As far as your perception, having been in the House for a number of years, now you're in the Senate, how would you explain the difference in, in, in the two houses? Well, I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the new kid on the block, and I probably don't fully understand the differences. My, my experience so far, I mean, and of course, I observe the Senate quite closely because we have conference, we have conference committees at the end of every session, and I, I'm uh, working for, with or against somebody from the Senate. Um, but my first impression, just being in the first caucus, is that it, it's obvious, but it really makes a big difference in the way the dynamics are. It's just smaller. So you have, even though you know the Democrats control the Senate completely now, we're the only, we're the first state since 1980 to have a one chamber that's completely one party, and all 25 uh, senators are Democrats, including me, and um, you, you, everybody gets in the room together, and you can actually have a, a longer conversation where people can talk for two or three minutes, and you don't feel like you're just slowing everything down because you don't, you're not talking in sound bites. And you can get away with that because there's only 25 of us, whereas in the, the Democratic caucus in the House, there was you know, usually in the, in the mid-40s, 43, 44, and it's a lot more people in the room. And if everybody talks for five minutes, you know, every issue takes three hours to deal with. So. Which is one of the reasons why we go from 3,000 bills to 22. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, 3,000 to 300, but yes. That's, okay. It's, it's, <laughs> yes, that's the idea. It's, and that's, yeah. You just can't deal with everything in, yeah. in that short a period of time. Yeah, which is, uh, from the outside, it's one of the challenges uh, that those of us who try to follow politics, uh, we always are fascinated by it. It's like, okay, well, how were those decisions made? I'm not going to ask you to answer that question, but oh, how were those decisions that made? That we, That's fine. Uh, as far as, okay, well, we have all these bills, and, well, this one, we can't quite get to this one. Well, it meant that there was something in it that was a challenge, something in it that was controversial maybe, something in it that it doesn't, didn't have a high, as high a priority as maybe something else. Or we didn't have any, or we didn't have any money. That's often, or, that's okay. often one of the, that's, the, that's the other big reason for not doing it is we don't have any money. If it has to go through one of the money houses that yeah. it, or committees, right. then it ends up, uh, okay. Yeah, um, so okay. That, uh, so that's just always been fascinating. Things that those of us on the outside take a look and say, you know what, I think this is important. I think this is valuable legislation that is really important now and it got shelved and and we get left with why often so. well so, i mean those of us who are on the inside often uh, or, or closer to the inside anyway uh often have the same question we don't it sometimes takes a while to do the sort of legislative forensics at the end of the session to f figure out why your bill died and if there's anything you can do about it or not and so for next session you know so we you know we I, i've done that a number of times and because there is no one likes to kill other people's bills because there's you always run the risk of somebody's going to kill your bill yeah. in, yeah. instead in, in the next time around and so there's a lot of effort gone into high, uh, covering your tracks about killing stuff now i ha have to admit that i haven't done a i don't cover my tracks very well as chairman of the judiciary committee i killed a whole bunch of bills and at I mean, just by not hearing them and uh you know so people usually knew who had killed their bill at my committee but your committee was one is is, is it, it's the if not I think it's the second largest committee second, under, under finance, and, right? And, house, and on the House side, yeah, it's, house the second, side, yeah. it's the second largest in terms of just uh, volume of bills that you get. So yeah. your staff had to be largest. There was a lot more to have to deal with anyway. Yeah, so I've been telling people for a while that getting elected to the Senate is a demotion because 
I have fewer <laughs> staff and uh, a smaller. I'm, I'm thrilled to have a committee at all, but it's not nearly as important a, a, as a committee as judiciary uh, in terms of uh, volume of bills coming through. Sure. sure. And, and what, what uh, is your committee? Your chairman? Of water, water land. Water it, it's land. unusual to, to get a, a committee in the in the Senate, or in that even more unusual in the House to get a committee as a freshman. But uh, yeah, so I'm flattered that leadership felt that I, they could trust me with it, sure. and I, I hope not to disappoint. But uh, yeah, I mean, judiciary. I had uh, three. I'd, we were like a small law firm. I mean, I'm an attorney, oh, yeah. and then we had uh, we had four. They had one permanent attorney, and we hired three more during session. So we were, you know, the, uh, a, a, a decent sized law firm, and we yeah. don't have that anymore. I mean, there's like four of us in the office total. So you're, you're so that's part of the, the the changes for you that you're dealing. Yeah, with. Yeah, that's part of it. I mean, it's, I mean, the the other big difference is, and you know, I don't, I don't. It doesn't. It's not some it's something I realized a long time ago, and most people who are observant of the legislature know this. But in the House, leadership tends to be more important. Um, you, the committee chairs, not everybody is a committee chair, and you, um, it, they're still the rank and file are important because you still got to have the votes to pass the bill on the floor. In the Senate, the tendency is that the committee chairs get what the, the committee chairs tend to be more of. Um, more influential because almost everybody's a committee chair, and they and there is a certain amount of log rolling that's necessary to get anything passed. And you don't want to cross other committee chairs if you can possibly avoid it. And so, unless there's something really egregious, uh, well, this is, these are just tendencies we're talking about here. But in general, you you you, you try to work you try to work stuff. I, I think it's also true that in the Senate, things are worked out more informally because there's fewer people, and you can just if you have a problem with the bill, you can go to the chair and say, hey, you know what, I really don't like this this section of this bill because of X, Y, and Z. And in the House, it tends not to be like that so much just because there's there's just so many people that you can't talk to everybody and that, with that sort of leisurely, still not leisurely in the Senate, but it's more leisurely than it is in the House, I think is fair to say. I would say that that's definitely one of the things. The the one session that I, that I worked, uh, 2015, uh, I definitely noticed that because I was working on the House side. Mm. And I saw the number of bills that came through and things that we saw and how in-depth we got into anything. I think I got more in-depth into some of it than than even the legislator I was working for got in with some of it. Um, so so it's interesting to see, okay, on the House side, you've got, we'll call it more time, more, I don't know if it's more time or, or, or how, more opportunity to dig deeper in and have those conversations. Because like, we never had those conversations. Well, and a lot of times, especially for the members who, if, you know, the guys who have been, the men and women who have been around politics a long time, most issues you've already seen before. So if someone comes in and says, uh, I, want, I want a bill on term limits, I've spent quite a few hours thinking about the pros and cons of term limits a long time ago, and I already know what I think. Well, then I want to have you come back to talk about that at another time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I know that when I, I was staff, too, before I was elected, and I was also staff on Capitol Hill 25 years ago, and that was the thing that first uh, impressed me, not necessarily positively, but it's just how quick decisions were made. But I think, on you know, after years of reflection on it, I don't think they are really made that quickly. It's just the thought... For most people, if you've been around a while, th there aren't very many new issues. Every once in a while, you get something that's novel, but most of the stuff is most of the ideas have been around for a while. It's just whether it could get through this time around, or or, or whether it's even desirable that it gets through. This yeah, time this time around, around yeah. as opposed to, or right. if, if it has. So, so, so somebody's thought about it already, and okay. almost almost always somebody's thought about it already. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that, that's a good. That's a good. Insight. Yeah. No. Don't be be a little bit reassured <laughs> anyway. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I just remember looking. There's a lot more of uh, what's the synopsis? Okay, good go. Um, yeah. And, and it's, as far as you know, what the language is. But that's uh, when does? Because I know, I do know that the bills get looked at word to word at some point. Several times, usually. Yeah. Where is that? In, is that within conference? Is that within um, uh, within leadership? Where where does it get looked at at that level? Uh, well, it usually gets looked at when before you introduce it. So you, there's usually. Mm, often several drafts of the bill before you even put it in. Mm -hmm. So the, the, uh, the lawyers at the drafting agencies will have looked at it and the draft, not all, the, not all the drafting agencies, not everybody who works for the drafting agencies are attorneys, but there is an, there's also a lead. So there's somebody who drafts it often as an attorney, then they have a, at least two or three layers of review before they even send the bill back to you. Well, then you as a member look at it and your staff look at it and say, ah, yeah, but you missed, this should have been a comma, not a period, and or 
that doesn't even, that's not even what we were trying to do. You know, and then you send it back and you go <laughs> you through it all again. the intent. <laughs> right. And, uh, and you do that again. And then, well, then when you hear the bill, you get a bunch more opinions about whether it makes sense or not. And those... Uh, so that's the... Um, that's as you as you come up with your idea. I want to do this bill, or someone brought an idea to you and you said, "Okay, yes, I want to I want to do that, and I want to put that into a bill form." That's you. You spent the time coming out of your office to say, "We want to introduce this bill." Right. And then it gets sent out because it has to be signed off. There needs to be co-signers and co-sponsors for it. And as it goes through that process, and then it goes in and get, and has a hearing. When it has a hearing, I'm I'm my guess is because I was never involved on on that side of it. Um, my guess is that the committee has gone through it, has read through it, and has talked about it a bit before the hearing, and then they just want to hear what the community and the stakeholders and, and other testimony is about it. Is that is that correct? How that works? Uh, well, I mean, different chairs do it differently. That that was um, we there were, there were certain. So the process, when, when I was judiciary chair, and I, like I said, I had more staff then, I, I try to do this now still, but it's not quite as thorough as I probably was when I was a judiciary. But uh, you, know, sort of, you sort of do a first cut, and you're just, and, and there's often there's duplicate bills that are almost identical. So you say, okay, some, some chairs will hear them all, but I usually didn't. I would just pick one that I thought was, if I wanted it to pass, I would pick the one that I thought was the, the most likely to pass because who introduces it also matters sometimes. Um, so there's a first cut where you're like, no, I'm not going to hear that, I'm not going to hear that. Then there's some where I'm definitely going to hear, and then there's like a group in the middle. And probably it's the group in the middle that at that stage gets the biggest, that gets the closest reading. You're like, okay, what does this thing actually do? So you read, either you or your staff, or you, either you and your staff sometimes, read it very carefully and say, okay, it does this, this, and this. I'm okay with this and this and this, but I'm not okay with that and that. So let's hear it, but let's plan. And right now, let's just say we're going to amend it unless we hear testimony or we get more information that says we shouldn't. Okay. So that. So then. So the, they actually. I mean, it's in some sense, it's amazing to me that there are any mistakes left in a bill at the end of it because it's been gone over so many times by so many people. It's like, how can anybody have missed anything? Sure. But it still happens. I mean, we've even on technical, you know, technical legal issues. Sometimes we literally will leave out. Uh, I remember a bill in Congress one time where they left out the enacting clause, which is like the first uh, clause at the top that uh, says, yeah. be it therefore enacted, oh, yeah. and they, they left it out. And it passed the whole, went through the whole process and nobody noticed. Wow. Well, then it's, it's not a bill. It has no effect. Right. And uh, they had to, and it was a controversial bill. I don't remember what it was, but they had to come back, reintroduce the thing, and, and re-vote on it. And they, they didn't have to run it back through the committees. It's more of a flexible process okay, the, so, yeah. in DC, but because I because I would I could have I would have recognized that as an opportunity to be I was against it I was only for it because it, I knew it wasn't a bill. Now right, that you know, right. I, no, I they, they, have, they, they, have, they have ways around <laughs> it up there that we don't really have here. But it was, you know, some sometimes that stuff happens. Yeah. But there's there's a lot of there's a lot of vetting. That's uh, it's it's important to I think hear that hear that part of it to really go through and know how in depth. Uh, the, these bills get looked at, bills and resolutions, and, and really uh, everything involved. But uh, there, there, it's also true, though, that especially I think problem. Well, both in the House and the Senate, but you do have to, as a rank as as somebody who's not on the committee. If you're not on the committee where the that the bill came through or came out of, mm -hmm. you do have to rely on the chairs to not to put things out there that are not vetted very well. And I, some, I mean, I, I was criticized sometimes for putting out bills that were excessively controversial. I mean, I'd vetted them. They they would have you know they'd work, but the the issue itself was controversial. Okay. Well, I don't think that's a bad thing. No, not personally. necessarily. No. I and I'm that was one of the things I promised myself when I was first elected that just because it was controversial didn't mean I was not going to deal with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or difficult. I mean, it, that's the thing. The easy problems are solved easily, and then there's some problems that are almost, I mean, almost impossible to solve. And I, from a political perspective, you never want to fail. Basically, you want you want to just say. I did. I accomplished this. I accomplished this. I accomplished this. I accomplished this. But if you do, if if you're worried about wins, if you're only worried about wins, then you never take on the hard stuff, and it just never gets addressed. And that uh, that isn't serving the public interest. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, certainly. So I'm glad you agree. <laughs> but you, but you have to. But you have to. I mean, I think it, you know. Realistically, you have to have some kind of a balance. You can't yeah. spend all your time on impossible problems because then everybody thinks you've done absolutely nothing. You can't always fight upstream. 
Right. <laughs> exactly. So. Although I do a lot of that. But All right. Yeah. Well, um, we're at our break, so we have to take a quick break. Okay. So yep. um, when we come back, we'll, uh, we're going to dig in a bit more as far as legislative agenda stuff is concerned. Okay. So. Sounds good. Thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. Once again, our guest today is new Senator Carl Rhodes. See you in one minute. Thanks. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet, please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating board members and owners about their responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Once again, welcome, Senator Carl Rhodes. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. So, okay, now we just had a good conversation about some of the, I guess, how things work a mm -hmm. little bit. But um, let's spend this, this last segment talking about how you develop other people will do it differently perhaps but how you develop what your session agenda is from the legislative perspective what bills you're interested in what bills you're not interested in how you even come to the bills that you want to bring forward so how does that happen how do you begin to develop that well I have to admit at least in, in my case it's a rather haphazard process um, I there's there's different sources of, you know, of where you can get your ideas of course in, in a world where there's multiple places to get news and but for me, I start usually with constituent requests. People will, when I, as you as you as you are aware, I, I knock on doors a lot during campaigns, and I knock on doors a lot when I'm not campaigning. And I do get ideas from constituents who say, you know, why is it that X? Why do why do we do it that way? And I'll be like, yeah, that's a point. I'll I'll, I'll be happy to put in a bill. And we've actually passed. One, I can think of two or three offhand of you know people literally that. Uh, I, I don't like to use the word literally because I can never, it's overused, but I think uh, we've passed two or three bills at least that were directly from the door, you know, from the doorstep to me to into the legislature and we passed them. That's, so that's huge. That's huge. And, to ha and that doesn't really get conveyed a lot. So that's, I'm No, and, and I think other, I think other members are, uh, that's very common. You know, people who ask me you know, people have a problem and they can't figure out why it's that way and they go to their legislator and. And the good legislators, of course, are ones who communicate routinely with their constituents, and so I, I think quite quite frequently that that that's how that's sort of the first level of okay, we're got to introduce these because these are the things that people, our constituents, have asked for. Sure. Um, the other sources, well, you know, some of the other sources are, I, I mean, I, I, you, if I think it was Tip O'Neill who famously said, "All politics is local. If you don't deal with the problems in your district, you're not going to be there that long." Uh, not that you necessarily should be there forever, but I'm, you know, you, you're, most people want to get reelected at least once, and um, so that's the other thing is I look at is you know neighborhood issues that I've noticed or that other people have brought to my attention, not even not necessarily constituents who specifically asking, but for example, one an issue that I've worked on for years and it, and it's one of these hard ones that we talked about before uh, that you it's almost impossible, but I, I think we're finally making some progress, but it's literally been like ten years, so. In, in, I represent Palama, and I, for a while I represented uh, uh, part of Kalihi too. We have all these lanes, and it's true up, and it's, it's true in the new district too, up the New Uanu Valley uh, in Putu, well, not so much in Putu but there are little privately owned lanes where the ownership is not known. The, the, it, we know we know for sure that it doesn't belong to the state, and it doesn't belong to the city. It belongs to a private landowner, but we don't know who. So the result is that no one is required to take care of it. The city, the city uh, has an, authorizes itself to take care of these lanes, but they don't have to. So if there's a major problem that they don't feel like dealing with, they don't. And, and they also don't do all of them. They're really short. They don't have very many people living on it or very, very, very many property parcels. They're not, off, they don't even, they're not even authorized to take care of them. 
So to me, this is really fundamental stuff. I mean, in a private property system, you need to know who owns the property. And we've spent years trying to figure that out. But that was something that, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody ever specifically said to me, can you please introduce a bill on this issue? But they certainly said to me, why, does, why do I have all these, why won't the city fix my potholes? And it's like, well, that's because, and after we dug into it a little bit, that's because we don't know who owns it. It's privately held by it's someone privately. because somehow within the land court records or within the There's boundary uh, surveys that have been done, it's, it's... Initially, I thought it would be easy. I thought we'd just go in and so it's, it's property. You've got to pay real property tax on it, right? So we yeah. went in, no one's paying real property no tax. They're all, they're all valued at a de minimis amount. So I think it's less than $100, so you don't pay property tax on it. So, that, <laughs> so I went from there, and, um, you know, we... We have gone to all kinds of extraordinary measures to try to figure them out. The Rollins Lane, I don't, there's a little tiny lane down behind, uh, down near Thomas Shiro Market. It's only like 100 yards long. It's too small for the city to take care of under their authorization. I finally did a, a, a title search, title guarantee, and they um, came back to me you know, after a couple of months and said, well, the last owner that we are aware of uh, uh, had a vested interest died in 1975. And you just got left. So that's, that's kind of how it gets loosely abandoned for one reason or another, right. and nobody... So theoretically, somebody owns it, but you'd never be able to find them all. But, because, well, because legally, then, who would then be that person's... Uh, who the heirs? Uh, who would the heir be, so right. it would fall to that person. So yeah, I think he had six kids, and then his kids, you know, then his kids had kids, and so, I don't know, there's probably 65 people who have some tiny, you know, one sixty-fifth undivided interest in the lane. And none of them want to talk about it. None of them want to Well, you can't even find them. We tried to find okay. them to start with, and after a while, we're like, you know what, this doesn't even make any sense, because even if we found them all, there's going to be a holdout. Somebody's not going to want to do whatever with it. Yeah. And, um, and in which case, some, you know, at the very least, what if we say, okay, how about we have the state or city and county buy it from you? Right, or to condemn it, or condemn, do or, something or whatever, in order to. Yeah. We'll take it, but so yeah. last last year it wasn't my bill, but we find you know, other people have this issue too. So we finally passed a bill that sets up a commission to decide whether these these lanes should be under county jurisdiction, under state jurisdiction, and then the, once that's decided, there there still be a very difficult process of they probably will all have to be condemned, and um, you know there's dozens and dozens and dozens of them. So it's it's a long term project, but. And there's, so, also, there's a lot of cost involved in that. There's a lot of cost in order to deal with it. So that's, an, that's another source of, you know, sort of general, and, and, and for me, of course, and in, in pretty much statewide, but homelessness, of course, is another one that's obvious that yeah. I, need to do, I need to try to do something about. Uh, you can target, you can st always start with the top issues that we know everybody is concerned right. about. Uh, you right. know, education, housing homelessness, uh, cost of living issues at all. Yeah. Uh, whether we're dealing with energy security, food security issues, whether we're dealing with prison reform, all these things get talked about right. in the media. So we well, know those, and are that's out there. and that's sort of the next level of, of the things that you, you, that you introduce, where something you know you've gone in discussion with friends, or you've gone to a conference where they're like, you know, this, if we don't do something about this, this is going to happen, that kind of thing. Then you get bigger picture things that, yeah, they affect your district, but they're they're just as important to the rest of the state. It's not really a, a district issue at that point, or not specifically a district issue. Now, how do you, I mean, I, and I also know there are crazy people like me who will show up and say, hey, I have this idea. Um, can you run this through? And, uh, and every now and then you guys will, and sometimes you won't. Yeah. <laughs> that's also how that goes. Um, you end up, that's where, I mean, I'm not a lobbyist, but I, I'm an advocate, so I will show up with ideas and say, hey, can we do this? Yeah. Um, and the more I have it fleshed out, the easier it is for you to even consume, let alone consider it. Uh, but then there are other groups, there are the lobbyists that will show up and say, hey, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. And that's something you have to work with. Yeah, well, that's, that's an, and that is another source. I mean, I, I've, I have introduced bills on behalf of, uh, of uh, interest groups. Um, as, as Neil Abercrombie was fond of saying, you know, it's, it's not that it's a, everybody's a special interest. I'm a special interest, you're a special interest. It's, yeah. it's the, 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 there's not a problem with it being a special, a special interest per se. The problem is, is it, is it good policy? Does it, does it hurt everybody else or does it just help that one interest? And, you know, you've got a balance between them and that's, uh, well, that's one reason I've always believed in public financing because a, a good politician will ignore their their big donors when they feel like it's in the public interest. The mediocre ones may not so much, and the really bad ones will actively court the special interest desires so that they can try to help them, and they don't. They're, they're less concerned about uh, what the overall effects are. And I would like 
that to be rooted out a bit more myself. But um, but, we, so, but the, in, the interesting <laughs> thing about that is that I, I have introduced public financing bills. I mean, I've always managed, I've always raised plenty of money, but uh, people are opposed to public financing because, well, I think it's mainly the Republicans for years have said, well, why would we want to pay money for people to run for office? And I would answer that, yes, that's exactly what you want to do because for the, like I say, the good, the good, pol the, the moral principled politicians are going to, they're going to tell their donors no when they need to. Yeah. But not everybody's a saint, right? So uh, you want, if you're going to be beholden to someone, you should be, it, the pref my preference would be that you be, be beholden to taxpayers, yes. not to some, not to just a particular interest. Yes, I think and, that makes, uh, I, I think that makes perfect sense. That's, uh, we, we can delve into. Having, the, having said that, public uh, financing uh, is uh, not a silver bullet because you, you still, you know, you'd still, unless you radically change the system, yeah. people can still donate money to advertising about a candidate, even if the candidate doesn't give them permission, right? Right. But uh, I've always thought that, you know, you, if, if you, if you believe that politicians are beholden to people, you should want them to be beholden to you, the taxpayer, to the not taxpayer somebody else. From your district, from your community. That's right. And sure. also recognizing this is one piece of it that's important. And it's coming from the House side, definitely. You spend a lot more time with your constituents within your House district, talking with them, making sure that you're taking care of that home business, basically. But from the House side and, and the Senate side both, it isn't just about your district is about the entire state. You're talking about how does this impact not just these roads, but roads across the entire state. Right. How does this impact not just my, you know, this neighborhood and this community, but what does this do? What are the repercussions of this on a grander scale statewide? That's right. No, and there's always there's always a bit of a divided uh, uh, conflict of interest for all uh, legislative leaders because you are you are responsible not just to your district but to the whole state, mm -hmm. and. You know, that's where it gets really difficult for, from a decision-making standpoint. If, if you look at something and you say, you know what, this would really be beneficial to the whole state, but for my district, it's a disaster. Yeah. You know, what do you do? I mean, that does come up sometimes. Uh, perfect example, it's not in my district anymore, but the, the new, yeah, it's not a perfect example. It's a, an illustrative example. Uh, the, the, the Kapalama military uh, reservation is going to be redone for, uh, to build a new shipping uh, container yard. Well, the, the island of Oahu, we need it. And that's how we get all our stuff, basically. We got, it comes through Honolulu Harbor. Yeah. But for the guys who actually live right there at Kapalama Military Reservation it's on the edge, it's going to have a negative impact. It's a negative impact because yeah. there's all the noise from these things dropping yeah. so down. How do you, so, how do you, so, so I, you would need to go talk with them and say, oh, this is what's going on. And I mean, you either ignore them and it just is, or you go talk to them and try to explain it. Either way, they're not going to be happy. Yeah, well, f fortunately in that situation, and, and this was probably foresightful on the part of the city, but the, the zoning is primarily industrial. Now, there's a lot of, there's grandfather, the people who are grandfathered okay, in, yeah. but it's a relatively small number of people. But, yeah, no, my, my response to that was I tried to convince the, the Department of Transportation, the state, to take into consideration the noise issue more than they had yeah, been yeah, to that yeah, point. Yeah. Now, whether they yeah. have and it's going to work out okay or not. I don't know. We won't know until the thing's built and it's sure, up and running. Sure. And there's a lot. But that's a, that's a pro that's a yeah. it's a good example of yeah. you know where the where the broader public interest probably conflicts pretty directly. It's, it's, a, nim it's a NIMBY. It's a oh. not in my backyard thing. Which is yeah. which is a hard hard thing. So yes. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, the, our that's time it. is done. All right. That's that was it. quick. So thank I'm you so much. I appreciate everyone for joining us uh, and for everyone who watches the show. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Thanks once again to Senator Carl Rhodes. We're hoping to have him back again to talk about term limits and things along those lines. That would be great. Um, happy holidays. Have a great holiday season. I will not be here next week, so Happy New Year. We will see you next year. Thank you to the staff and the crew here at Think Tech Hawaii. See you next year.